Good evening. I want to welcome you all to the school district of Coney County trustee meeting, uh, the regular regular meeting for October the 19th. We already had a special uh, executive session starting at four o'clock, and uh, we are uh, now going to proceed with our open session. Uh, at this point in time, I would like to uh, have a moment of silence, and if you'd like to participate, please do so. Thank you. At this time, if you want, want uh, we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, our next item is approval of the agenda. Are there any issues or questions with the agenda that you see before you all? Then without objection, we the uh, agenda is approved. Uh, is there anyone that would like to have a p participate in public uh, comment? It's a little different because Mrs. Gibson's not here today, so... I just want to make certain everybody was given an opportunity that wants to do so. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we have approval of the minutes now for September 14th, the work session meeting, and September 21st, the regular board meeting. Do you all see anything with that? Any issues with it? Okay, then without objection, uh, uh, those minutes have been approved. Uh, Dr. Thorslin, superintendent's update. Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, the main thing I want to update you about today is um, just kind of where we are with COVID-19 in our schools. And uh, Mr. Hamby may jump in and help me a little bit because he was on the phone after closing hours this afternoon uh, getting some the latest information. But um, we had a kindergarten class that was closed at Blue Ridge Elementary School a couple of weeks ago. That class started back today, and we've had no further incidences at Blue Ridge Elementary that I'm aware of, so we think that, that uh, we should be good to go there. Uh, we do have another kindergarten class at Westminster Elementary that is still um, participating in virtual learning right now because of... Um, a quarantine situation. They should be able to go back, I think, next week. And then our our biggest issue has been at Seneca High School. And I think I talked last week about several cases. We ended up closing two additional classes last week for a total of three. We had two cases reported Friday, three over the weekend, additional student cases at Seneca High and one additional staff member, I believe, today. So we have um, a total right now of four classes that are have been transitioned to distance learning. That is, um, I don't know the number, so I'm not prepared to tell you the exact student number, but it is over 100 students quarantined at this point. A lot of them are duplicates. Uh, they, some of the ones that they found through the contact tracing were already out with the two classes that were put out last week, so um, we can get the exact number, but I don't know what that number is, but she did tell me in the message that a lot of them were already on quarantine that they would have added with this class. Right. So um, there is still uh, certainly a cluster. I'm not going to shy away from that. Uh, we've had a, a cluster of cases at Seneca High, and we're going to monitor that um, very closely. Sherry McLaughlin, our lead nurse, has been on this. She's working with the nurse at Seneca and with Ms. Leroy at Seneca High. They are, um, 
doing all of the tracing and contacting all the parents that need to that they need to and um, you know we're we we have talked about whether we need to take um, I guess more aggressive action um, we're not at a point of doing that yet but we're going to be talking about that tomorrow and um, making decisions that, that we feel like are, are best for the students and staff at Seneca High so that, that's really kind of where we are. Are there any other? I think that's we had our little bit of film tomorrow. We had our first K, first positive James Brown. Yeah. Okay. So, but again, that's one case. And and if you go back over the past probably couple of weeks, the vast majority of our schools have no cases. Um, so I know there has been concern voiced uh, because nationally and in the state we've seen increasing numbers of cases and that's true for our school district as well but they've been the the overwhelming majority have been at Seneca High so again 15 of our 16 schools are not really seeing any significant outbreaks just a case here case there so uh, we feel like the precautions that we're taking are being effective in most of our locations. One thing that we discussed this afternoon, and I'm not um, a medical expert, uh, but something Mr. Handy and I discussed that I do think it's worth um, talking to families about. And it's, it's not as important at the elementary and middle school level because those students are not mobile by themselves. But at the high school level in particular, when the school nurse or the principal calls and tells a family that because of proximity to a positive case we need your child to be quarantined for the next two weeks that's not just a recommendation to quarantine them from school that's all we can control but that recommendation would be to quarantine them from other activities as well if a high school student that drives gets quarantined from school and they're home but they're driving to their friend's house and going and hanging out and things like that that's not a quarantine and it's not effective because then you're still getting those students in groups where the virus could be transmitted from student to student so one thing we want to encourage parents to do is to quarantine their students from other activities whether that be work church, um, certainly parties and things like that. Uh, when a student is on quarantine, they were notified for a specific reason and we would like to encourage families uh, of high school students to, uh, to take a quarantine seriously is, is the bottom line. Uh, anything to add to that? No, I was just going to say that, you know, because we had a big part of the Seneca thing is from an asymptomatic student who see you didn't know they were positive and they continued to feel fine they came to school and the only way they found out was through a family member testing so so they contact traced it down to where the majority of these cases have, have been because you know sometimes teenagers are asymptomatic and you know kid didn't do anything wrong didn't know um, but they they were in school and then um, what we have seen it grow we've seen um, issues with some of the, the quarantining aspect of it outside of the, the school so we just want to make sure we're doing all we can to keep the school open yeah and and one of the reasons we are open is because we believe that there is a social emotional part of education too and, and students need community they need to be around other students and things like that uh, but we have to do it in a safe way and and part of that means you know abiding by by quarantines uh, so we're going to continue to do uh, the things we've been doing and, and we may have to take more aggressive actions uh, if the number of cases continues to increase in the in the school district we'll probably continue to try to do it in a very targeted way like we have been doing I don't think that an increase in cases at Seneca High warrants closing a school in another part of the county uh, that's not seeing an increase in cases at least right now now we'll certainly abide by recommendations that we get from our nurses and from DHEC and other medical professionals 
but we we do feel like it's important that kids are in school uh, and uh, we're just going to do the best we can and, and stay on top of it and uh, you know we encourage parents community members to, to call and contact us if if they have questions or concerns about things but, but um, I can assure you that it's not for a lack of diligence that uh, you know these cases are occurring because our principals are spending a considerable amount of time doing this every day our nurses are, are just consumed with this every day and um, you know they're, they're working hard to stay on top of it and keep students as safe as they can we have to answer any questions Dr. Thorson could you remind me um are the children's temperature taken at school, or I think you told us that we encourage the parents to take it at home, is that correct? We do encourage families to do the wellness mm -hmm. check before sending students to school mm -hmm. each morning. We are not currently taking temperatures of every student that comes into school. There are limited exceptions for after school activities when we know students are going to be in close proximity to one another, but we do have thermometers in those situations. Mr. Henry might can share more of the details of that. I know for, before sports practices and things, we've done, done some of the we, do. we, we check them uh, before athletic events. We check them uh, at the end of the day on Friday, um, the, the band, the cheerleaders, before the football game, the football players, the coaching staff, the sponsors. Um, and we are now, um, as of maybe two weeks this Thursday, but we are checking kids from the high school that come in to go to the student section uh, at the gate mm -hmm. or at the desk table, you know, where they enter um, and making sure that they don't have a, a temperature because we had some, as Dr. Thor was alluded to earlier, we had some situations where, you know, people weren't feeling well and came to, to events. Now, temperature is not necessarily going to always show up and that's one of our kind of mm -hmm. the things that we battle with, but we thought we would at least give it uh, give it a shot and, and we use 99.5 instead of the 100.4 uh, that well, we use now but for athletic and after school events we say if it's over 99.5 and they're not allowed to participate or attend and we do check that so that's the mm -hmm. only place we're checking on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. okay. and I guess the last comment I'd have is is I know uh, as any situation extends and, and gets kind of tedious, which I think is is what we all feel with coronavirus. There is a tendency to want to lax, mm -hmm. uh, be, be a little more lax with precautions and things. So I want to encourage everyone um, from students to our faculty and staff to parents and families to maintain vigilance mm -hmm. with this. Um, continue wearing masks when you're in places where you're in close proximity to people. Uh, continue trying to limit uh, large gatherings and um, you know stay quarantined as best we can because that's what's going to help minimize our exposure and, and the possibility of this continuing to be a problem for us. When uh, students are identified as having uh, COVID, do we go in and look at those classrooms and disinfect them we even do. more so than... We, we do. We, we, um, uh, we do it in the district office when somebody might. <laughs> so we have a we have a cleaning system. We have those um, electrostatic uh, machines, and, and we use them. Every school has at least one. Um, we do it in athletics. Uh, if I'm asking, I guess um, Seneca, when when we close the football team down for, for right now uh, because of cases, we uh, we do extra cleaning in the locker rooms and, and that kind of thing. So yes, we do. Um, a lot of extra cleaning right, right now so okay. those folks are working hard too uh, everybody's working hard okay. to try to make it work but uh, real real pleased with that but we use we've gotten some of the stuff yeah, I know the big thing's been in the newspaper and the radio about the the uh, PPE from the, the state the 33 million dollars we haven't gotten much of this round uh, we got our first round but we were getting a lot of uh, supplies we're very grateful for we think it'll be enough to get us through um, the rest of this year actually but um, with our CARES Act money we, we ordered a, a lot of uh, the machines and devices and kind of laid out. Uh, buses are cleaned after every route so and it's, a, it's an ongoing process.
<laughs> and I actually did just remember one more thing I think is pertinent to share tonight. Um, kind of off topic a little bit, but Miss um, Beerman, the State Superintendent of Education, had a conference call with superintendents this morning. Miss Morin, myself, participated in that. And the federal government has given the states a little more flexibility in some of the CARES Act funding, which was a good thing for us. It was the, the rule that we had to spend all CARES Act money by December 31st. That has now been extended to September 30th of 21. So that gives us a, a little more breathing room on that. And then the other thing I think that's very important that was announced at that meeting this morning is the wireless hotspots that the state paid for for students who did not, their families that did not have internet at their homes. That was also set to expire December 31st, but this change allows the state to fund those through June 30th now. So the hotspots that have been distributed to our families, which is more than 700, 701, yeah. Um, those will all be lit now until June 30th. Very good. And we had some extra ones, did we not? We do. We have a few that we're, we're working with. We're still got some that don't be working with us, but so we're switching out some. But yeah, we're going to have a few left, not, not a whole lot, but we'll have a few more that we'll put out. All right. Thank you all very Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Item 7, discussion and possible action on the District 1 board seat appointment. I guess that's why most of you are here. Uh, we, uh, I want to personally thank you for, uh, thank all the candidates, all 12 of them. I think initially we, uh, when we were deciding whether we were just going to choose it, choose an individual ourselves or uh, go out to the to District 1, we were kind of concerned because we didn't see a lot of response on those first couple days and uh, then all of a sudden we had 12, 12 very good uh, individuals and then we had three finalists and tell you the truth uh, I've hired a lot of people in my time but uh, this has been very tough uh, we had three finalists I wish we had a little more table space up here for y'all because uh, I think we could have handled every one of you up here. Um, just to, re just to uh, go over, the finalists were Steve Smith, Richard Blackwell, and Dean Baer. And the board had uh, made a decision. Is there a motion to fill seat one for the school district of Oconee County? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve Mr. Dean Baer as board member for District 1 to complete the two-year term vacated by Mr. Jerry Lee. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Dean Baer will be uh, will fill Jerry's position starting uh, the I guess the next meeting is November the 9th. So he'll have to take an oath on the 9th. Uh, I, I also want to say something. It's, it's admirable to see people volunteering to get out in front of people and try to present themselves. Uh, it's always it's tough. Well, it's not tough. It's easy just to sit back. But when you see people step out and try to do something that they're probably not familiar with, uh, that's very admirable. You know, getting out in the public and trying to convince them to, I want to do the following. I'll, you know, vote for me. Uh, that's tough. And uh, I admired everyone that uh, participated as a candidate and as a finalist. Uh, I can only imagine come 2022, there's going to be an awful lot of people for District 1 seats because you already got your resumes already set up. So uh, I, I really hope you would uh, consider uh, pursuing your, your this desire. All right. Uh, we have some action items 
Uh, all of these are going to be second reading approvals. Uh, let's see, Exhibit 2, uh, Policy ACB, Educational Equity. Uh, anybody want to share? Sure, I will. Just to remind you, this was a policy that you passed on first reading. It came from the School Boards Association, South Carolina School Boards Association, recommended that all districts have an educational equity policy. It will be new to our policy manual, but it basically just says um, that we're responsible for educating all students, um, no matter their background, um, and just that we're to provide a high quality education to every student. And those are things that I hope people would say we do anyway, so I don't think this policy is going to be a, a departure from what we're already doing. Um, it's just, it puts it in on, on paper that um, this is what the school district is responsible for doing. So I, I think it's a good, a good policy to say that we need to educate kids no matter what their background is, what their uh, sex, race, uh, religion, None of that matters. It's our job to educate all students. Is there a motion on the floor for the policy ACB educational equity to be approved? Mr. Chairman, to make a motion that we approve in second reading policy ACB educational equity. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. All right, here's one of our combos. This is Exhibit 3, Service Animal Policies. Mr. Hanvey, is that yours? Oh, <laughs> oh okay. He took it from me last time. Oh, okay. I was rushing enough to allow it. Let him have it, okay. And just as a reminder on this, we have a, currently we have a service animal policy, but it's one policy that was guidance for all groups of individuals. But a school district policy manual is generally divided into three different categories of people. It's part of the policy manual applies to the general public and all visitors to our school district. Part of it applies specifically to staff, faculty and staff, and then part of the policy manual applies specifically to students. So this um, change takes our service animal policy and puts it in all three locations in the policy manual. Um, it doesn't, it's not a large departure from what our policy said. Um, we did, Mr. Herring had asked a question when we first uh, brought this policy, but again, recommendation of the, the School Boards Association. Um, there's also in this group of policies, just a policy that deals with animals in schools, which, which talks more about um, teachers having pets in classrooms and different things like that, but just instructions for us to keep that educational, keep that safe, clean, things like that. So that's um, just a short summary of these policy changes. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, is there a, a motion to uh, approve policy ACE, service animals public, policy GB, GAA, service animals staff, Policy IMG, Animals in Schools. Policy JL, CDD, Service Animals for Students. And Policy JL, CDD, R, Administrative Rules. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve the five policies that were just read to us, um, referenced as service animal policies combined. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. Mr. Hanvey, I guess this one's yours. Yes, and this is um, the, the policy change and, and the administrative rule that uh, Mr. Leroy came and spoke to you all about at uh, the, the meeting last night. Uh, but basically, I know you preached in the choir and you're tired of hearing it, but um, as Dr. Thornton said, the School Wars Association uh, has made these changes based on uh, the current evaluation system that we use. So we're basically getting the words and procedures matched up with our rubric 4.0 uh, system. 
straight from the State Department of Ed regarding the levels and types of evaluations that our employees go through so that they know up front what they're going to be evaluated on, how they're going to be evaluated on, um, how often they can be evaluated, and, and those things. So um, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, happy to try to look at more specifics as you want. Anybody want to question them? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I do want to say that I'm, I'm really excited that uh, with our induction teachers, just a tough year for everybody. Right. Really, for induction teachers, this, this could be a, a, a make or break whether they want to stay in the profession or not. And real, real excited that uh, the job that um, the, the combo of HR and, and instruction are doing, the kind of tag team working with our induction teachers and supporting them. And uh, we, we're really working on that to, to make sure that they get the support they need and are able to, to get through the difficult time because we've kind of thrown them into it. I have a question. Does uh, our induction teachers, those are our first year teachers, right? Yes. Are they actually teaching what they thought they were going to teach? In most did cases, I say did I say it right? Yeah. They, they weren't switched around too <laughs> They much. weren't switched they around too much. Wanted to try to keep them with, with, with something, something that they're right. Curly, but they, they're, they're kind of used to. But, uh, so they're, they're doing well. There, there might have been some special ed ones that we kind of tweaked a little bit, but nothing, nothing major. Okay, because I know that would have been an eye opener for some of them to well, walk in and do something different. They come in and go to a self-contained class, so they're mm -hmm. teaching all four subject areas, which that was probably different than their uh, student teaching experience, where they were probably doing team teaching and that kind of thing. But um, they, they've handled them like pros. I've been in a lot of our induction teacher classes, and, and they are they're doing a great job. Really excited. Got a lot of uh, homegrown folks, and real, real excited about that. I'm proud of them. Good. Okay. We have good. had teachers um, certainly step up to the plate this year sure. and yeah. teach things that are maybe outside of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. uh, we even had a teacher last week volunteer to move from one school to another because we had a need that we tried to hire someone to fill the need. We couldn't find someone, so a school where there was a little bit of overstaffing. One of the teachers volunteered to move to to a completely different level from a middle school to an elementary school, and that's just a good example of what our what our teachers and employees are doing this year to um, meet the needs when they come up. Uh, people are working hard, so it's a good thing. Every one of them are, because I mean, just think of it: every classroom teacher is running around with a mask on, trying to keep those kids distant. Uh, it's not what they uh, thought it was going to be. And we're not certain how long this is going to last either. All right, well, we have uh, Exhibit 4 refers to policy GCA, pardon me, GCOA, Evaluation of Instructional Staff, and policy GCOA-R, Evaluation of Instructional Staff Administrative Rules. Is there a motion to approve? Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve on second reading the evaluation of instructional staff policies combined. Second. Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. Well, they said this was going to be a fast meeting because we have, uh, I understand there is no reason to go into executive session. I think we've had enough of that for today. Uh, any further personnel changes need to be made. So, uh, uh, this concludes our open session and we are going to adjourn. Thank you very much for your time and we appreciate you coming.